Mic check, mic check, mic check. Mic check, mic check.
this session? So everybody get really comfortable and uh, straighten your back. We're just going to do a little five minute or so meditation. Relax your shoulders, relax your jaw, relax your eyes, the area around your eyes. Take a deep breath and then let everything out. Become aware of your breath in your belly. Notice the place or the point at which the out breath ends and the in breath begins without changing your breath in any way. Just let it be natural. Just notice it. In addition to that, 
notice the whole out breath from the point where the in breath stops and the out breath begins. Notice that whole part of the breath, the whole out breath. like you're a fly on the wall. You're just noticing it. And then just kind of um, at the end of the out breath, let everything just dissolve. Without changing anything about your breath, the natural rhythm of it. Any thoughts that you are having, let them dissolve with the end of the out breath. And let everything else that you're carrying in your mind or your body, any kind of tightness, any emotions or feelings, let those dissolve with the out breath. let it all go. Any expectations that you're having about today or in your life Let those dissolve. And just be at home with yourself.
Notice that when, you, when you're dissolving at the end of your out-breath, your attention is in the body. Your attention is not on thoughts, but it is on the body. Notice how the more you let go, of thoughts, you are in the body. Your attention goes to the body. And very slowly wiggle your toes and your fingers and slowly, slowly open your eyes. Come back into the room. Welcome everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here once again and um, see all your smiley faces. Um, so yesterday we went through and to get to know each other a little bit, we took about 60 seconds to say our name and where we're from and a little bit about why we're here today. So unfortunately, I'm going to put you on the spot, those of you who just arrived today and were not here last night. Um, and I would really like you to do that so um, we can have a better understanding of where you're coming from. So, someone please start. Would you like to start? Sure. Hi, I'm Rachel. Uh, I'm from Michigan, Detroit, originally. And uh, I came out about the first walk through my school, Otis, and I was interested because I'm really into uh, meditation and I'm a creative person in graphic design, so I'm interested in finding out how those two worlds connect. So. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, no, no, go ahead. No, 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 you don't have to go. Okay. 
Oh, great. Great. Excellent. OK. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. I'm Sarah. I'm just going to take piggyback off everything Ben said for us. Mine is being commissioned. But I did hear about it through a Christmas surprise and then you will also do graphic design. And um, I feel like the curriculum there is like um, really like conceptual. And now I'm finding myself in this like real world of really commercial art and I hear, you know, which is sort of the counter the like commercial world of creativity and trying to like become more spiritual within that um, and find ways where I can have them kind of coexist and maybe bring more spirituality to whatever it is that I do professionally. Right. Maybe find a way to have that and draw from that in my more of my own practice. Great. Sounds good. You live in Ohio? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, so, since um, many of you weren't here last night, I'll explain a little bit about what I'm doing here. I was a painter and a musician before I discovered the Dharma. And I'm still a painter and a musician, but in a completely different way now. And I think I found the Dharma because I was doing, I was being a creative person, but I didn't really know why I was doing it. And 
then I, when I found the Dharma, uh, Buddhism, meditation, I sort of discarded the world of the arts because I was so interested in what they were telling me about how things existed, how my world worked, how things work in the world. Um, that I, at that point, I, I think I didn't really need to be doing creative work because I was just so immersed in this philosophy and psychology and practice of meditation and working with the mind. And then as I, you know, after six or so years of studying Dharma, I realized that it needed something else. My Dharma practice needed something else. And it was the creative process. Um, even though Dharma is full of ideas about creati creativity and how we create in the world, how we create our reality in the world, I still needed to do something physical, you know? Like really just make stuff. <laughs> Um, and I kind of discovered that's one of the reasons why I'm here, is actually I need to make things in the world. That's why I'm in the world, you know? So after being carried away with all this emptiness teachings and like um, finding my head in the clouds, I had to come back down to earth and like actually do stuff in the physical world. Um, and then I learned that actually enlightenment happens, the process of enlightenment happens in the body. It doesn't happen up in outer space. So <laughs> as much as I didn't want to come down out of outer space, because <laughs> it's so pleasurable up there, um, I, um, I really had to, I had to be in the world. So. Um, so the, really one of the only ways for me to be in the world is to be a creative person and, and, um, and I think that's because it's so close to the Dharma the creative process is so close to everything I learned in the Dharma um, and I dare say that it is the Dharma it's the same thing it just looks different So, I really like what Robert Irwin said about the purpose of art. Robert Irwin is, if, for those of you who don't know his work, he's a, he's a sort of master installation artist uh, from California. I think he's from California, but I think he lives in San Diego now and um, he said that that art is really not about making paintings or doing performances or making music it's it's a tool for extended consciousness which is um, really interesting to me, that means it's a meditation. It's a, it's a process. And it's not about what we're creating. It's about that we're creating. That we are creating, you know. And that is the, that's the thing I was looking for. I needed someone to tell me, look, you can be creative, because that's what it's all about. And then I discovered the teachings of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, um, who instantly became my all-time hero. 
and I realized that there are a lot of teachings. He did a lot of teachings on what he called Dharma art, um, which is now carried on into the Shambhala world called, called Shambhala art, um, which exists here in LA. So, so then I just, I dove into these teachings and they're, they're amazing. Like for an artist who has this, I mean, for any artist, because all artists are extremely spiritual people. Um, it's just uh, like a diamond in the rough, you know, it's, it's um, the depth of these teachings just is astounding to me. So I hope to share that with all of you uh, today and tomorrow. So I'm really interested in the purpose of art. What is the purpose of art? Because that's the, that's, that's the whole thing. The purpose, the intention of what we're doing is everything. It affects everything and what we do and how we do it. And it is about how, we're, how we do art and not really what we do. Although it's important to, I think, to um, find a medium that we like and that we relate to and then stick with that medium. Very difficult for me, personally, because I like to do <laughs> a lot of different things. But, um, but there's something about sticking with the medium that's really very important, I think. Uh, but so let's, let's go over what the purpose of art is. Trumper Rinpoche talked about art as overcoming aggression. And last night we talked a lot about what aggression is. Um, so I won't go too much over it, but the opposite of aggression, he said, was inquisitiveness. So it's really interesting. Inquisitiveness to me is like the big question mark. Like you're just, you're just here and you're open to whatever comes. And aggression is like you're not really here and you're trying to manipulate your world, the exterior world that you think is different from you. In some way, even the most subtle ways. So, Oh, I was. It's right here. Thank you. <laughs> you guys are like trying to trick me. <laughs> you're left handed. I don't know if it's easier. Um, we we'll find that. out. Okay. <laughs> um, no, let's keep it there. Let's keep it there. Sure. Sure. Um, I'll try my best. Okay. All right. Excellent. I will, I will try to keep up the volume. Uh, so, actually, yeah, can we move this? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. There's one purpose, overcome aggression. Another might be to wake up. 
and to wake other people up out of our stupor of subconscious mind chatter. Another one might be to spread, spread the love, <laughs> joy, peace, happiness, whatever, like whatever makes people feel good, um, compassion, truth, wisdom. And I want to hear your ideas about what the purpose of art is also. Any ideas other than what we have up here already? To relate. To relate? I like that. Or translate, relate or translate. Okay, relate, translate. Communication. Right. Transformation. To let go? That's pretty good. I'll go with that. <laughs> so, That's really all we need to be concerned about when we're making art or being creative. We don't really have to use the word art because art is kind of a uh, heavily misused word. So we'll just say being creative or a person who is creative, a creative person, um, the act of creativity. Uh, so, <laughs> there's a whole world of expectations about what being creative means, and we don't really need to concern ourselves with that, I don't think. But for the sake of knowing what we don't need to be concerned about, or pay attention to, let's just list what the common expectations of an artist might be. Um, I think more like the the world, what the world in general, like what you what you perceive of people, other people in the world, um, the sort of status quo of like what what your experience is of like people's ideas about what 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 they want. Perfection. Perfection. What's that? Oh, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Yeah, that's a big one.
Oh, yeah, right. Original. OK. Must have meaning. Okay. Good or bad. I keep running out of room. How about questionable? Hmm? Valuable. Uh huh. Worth money. In that kind of way? Yeah, or just the people want it. Mm. Or right. the other is trendy or worth right. a lot. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Um, another thing might be people expect artists to produce. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to produce what sells. So this brings up the point of confusion about art and creative people. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a confusion that is sort of epidemic in our culture. So Because we're, I mean, it's, it's kind of in our training, right? You know, you go to art school or design school, and this is really what you're trained to do. Um, as those of you who have gone to school for it um, probably know. And uh, this confusion, uh, much of this confusion has to do with the product. Right, not the process. So, as a Dharma artist, or a, what Trungpa Rinpoche called a genuine artist, the focus is on the process and not the product. So then if the focus is on the process, it eliminates a lot of this expectations, although we still have expectations about the process, but it eliminate, eliminates a lot of the confusion about what we're really doing as creative people. And once we understand this, that it is about being in the moment and just doing the work, then it gets a lot easier to get into the work, to get into the flow, in my experience, anyway. So, how how do we get into the flow? Um, it's a 
Very good question. How do we get into flow? And so one of the ways would be focus on the process, work with our medium, and work with it as much as possible. And do a meditation, some kind of a, have a meditation practice, an actual sitting meditation practice. If you haven't meditated, most of you I'm sure have meditated plenty. Um, if you don't have a sitting practice, it's really important to have some kind of a actual practice where you're working directly with your mind. Um, and Trungpa Rinpoche was very, very uh, emphatic about that, having that um, in addition to doing your artistic, creative process practice. So The other thing that I think is really important um, is the responsibility that we all have as having these sort of gifts from God or the divine as a creative person. Because as we were talking about last night, the, the artist is the pioneer of humanity. Not the scientists or the mathematicians or the inventors. It really is the artists. Maybe those other things as well. But in my mind, the art is the spark of culture. It's the, it is painting outside of the lines, which is totally necessary for a culture to evolve. People need to break rules so that new things can come about and people can experience new things and become different than they were before. So that's a pretty huge responsibility to have. Um, and I think it's really important to know that you are the chosen few, <laughs> you know? You really are. Um, and to waste that would just be, it would, it would be tragic. Um, and I think you all know that. Um, In terms of cause and effect and what effect we have on our world, um, it's kind of like the, you, you guys know the butterfly effect, right? You've heard of that butterfly flaps its wings and then causes this snowballing effect and then there's a hurricane somewhere in the world eventually. So, um, and we also talked about karma, one of the, the laws of karma is that karma expands. So there are things like in my personal life that, I, that I've seen, art or otherwise, people, things people have told me that had a huge effect on my life. It could be the tiniest, smallest thing, but they just like changed everything for me. Um, and art being in the business of inspiration, we have to be really careful about what it is we're making and how we're making it, especially how we're making it. Because how we're making it ends up in the piece somehow. Somehow the product carries the process with it. It a, becomes a portal to the process, the state of mind you're in. Last night we talked about Mark Rothko and 
how when you look at a painting like that, you feel something that's in the painting, but it's not actually in the painting. It's your interaction with the painting. It's the interdependent relationship between you and the painting. So knowing that what you're producing, and especially how you're producing it, can affect a lot of people um, should be very, um, it should be really something important um, in how you produce something, what you're spreading around. Um, and another thing that, you know, I keep on going back to Trump or Rinpoche, he was also very adamant about um, going against this idea of art that turns people's heads, the ego-related art that centers on the individual making the art. And those of us that are cr creators know that the whatever comes through us is not ours, actually. We're just a vessel. Um, and so it's not really about us. It's about, again, it's about the process of letting go and letting something come through you and come into the world. Um, and we can steer that any way. We can steer whatever comes through us in certain directions because we have this thing called free will. And so we can take this energy and we can try to impress people or make money or produce a lot. Or we can go the other direction, um, inspire people and have an effect on people in another wholly different way uh, by getting them to feel something that they haven't felt before. So, um, so yeah, how do we get into flow? There's this quote by Franz Kafka I really like. Do not even leave the house. Only sit at your table and listen. Do not even listen. Be wholly still and alone. For the world will present to you... Wait, here we go. The world will, will present to you its unmasking. It can do no other. In ecstasy, it will writhe at your feet. So that, to me, that points to the meditative discipline of being still and alone. And one of the really helpful things about being still and alone is this idea of space and relating to space. And so this square, this white square that is sitting in the middle of all of this is our um, metaphor for space. AKA square one. So this is square one. This is where everything begins. It's the white canvas, the empty stage, um, the blank screen, however you want to um, talk about it. But it is, it's where we all begin. And 
it's also the state of it's also a state of meditation where your mind just stops thinking. And it's awakeness. It's a being totally aware. Once we have this sense of space, once we're in touch with this sense of space, um, that is around and between all of the thoughts, we get more and more space as we practice. Um, the space provides the room for the creativity or the process of creation to arise. Cannot possibly happen without space. So the practice is relating to space. How do we relate to space? And just to reiterate what we talked about last night, it can be scary. It can be really scary to relate to space. Um, because it's like jumping out of an airplane sometimes, you know? Like, we're just not used to it. We're so habituated to form. Totally habituated. We have a body and we identify with our bodies. Our bodies are mostly form. And um, we latch on to the form, you know, because we're only because we're habituated to it. And that's just how we were brought up. Um, so, and form can come in many different forms like loud rock music, for instance. It's also a form. <laughs> but if we, <laughs> if we can relate to space, if we can actually come from a point of space, mm -hmm. then the form just doesn't really bother us as much. Have you noticed that? Like in a meditation practice, when you're practice, practicing a lot, and you come against forms in the world, um, like 80s rock or something, and you're just like, yeah, it's fine. It's just 80s rock, you know, or 90s or whatever um, that I don't really listen to normally. But it's OK. It's just I can get along with it, you know? Because there's enough space there in your mind that it just, you can just observe it and not judge it. Um, so I wanted to talk about this idea of felt sense and thought sense, which is one of the things they teach in felt sense uh -huh, versus thought sense. I'll explain. It's one of the things they teach in, in um, the teachings in Shambhala art. And so it's this idea of feeling um, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. And then the sixth one, uh, mind. But really, mind just being thoughts. So the thoughts that your mind holds, I guess you could say. Um, so feeling the five senses versus thoughts. And it's a, it's a really interesting distinction to make when you're talking about the creative process. Um, because as Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche, the son of Chogyam Rinpoche said, um, it's really difficult to create art um, based on concept. When you're, you have an idea in your head and you're trying to express the, the notion or the idea in your head and make it tangible in the world. Um, 
it's it's coming it's coming in the wrong direction. Um, very difficult to to make art that way. Much easier way to make art is to get into flow, which is through the body, through the five senses. So that's the felt sense. That's what they call the felt sense. And this is um, let's do this first. Anyone see that? What is this? A sign? Did you say sign? Yeah. Laser jet printout? I don't know if it's laser jet. It might be, um, yeah. I'm not sure. It's a copy or something. Anyone else? Ink and paper. OK. All right. Good answers. What is that? It's 2D hat. <laughs> ink and paper. OK, all right. <laughs> Once again, we have ink and paper. I like it. All right. So then what is this? Signified. It's the signified. Fabric and shape. It's outdated fabric and shape. <laughs> Someone might have a problem with that in this room. <laughs> but yeah, OK, we'll accept that. This is style. All right. Anything else? For some purpose. Huh? It's a toy. It's a toy that you can put on your body. It's a prop. <laughs> A what? Teaching device. Teaching device. Ah. <laughs> now you're on to me. <laughs> Is it a pen? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, who said sign? You said sign, right? Um, so, there's also this, this idea of sign and symbol. Um, this could be a sign for something else. So, sign for this. So directions to that, right? Um, it's really interesting this connection between. Uh, let's see. Felt sense equals. Symbol. Thought. Sense. Equals sign. So. <laughs> the thought. Sense. Of this. What is a thought sense of this? The sign. Oh. What's that? Hat. The thought sense is hat. Yeah. It's hat. You look at this and you and your mind computes uh, like in, in Tibetan Buddhism they call it a dunchi. It's a frozen image in your mind, in your memory, and when you see this, you're you're habituated to automatically think, pull this thing out of the files, out of the, um, the file cabinet in your head, and you picture something maybe like this, right? Is that what happens? Mm -hmm. OK. So this would be the sign 
that points to this. Yeah, it would, yes. We can go down that rabbit hole, but we won't right now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, so this idea of symbol, this thing, <coughs> the common understanding of symbol, uh, maybe we can pull up the dictionary definition of symbol real quick. Can you see that? Is that? Is that? Can you see anything up there? Okay. Huh? Oh, no source. Okay. Let's, can we check our connection? <coughs> Right. Is, are you I asking us? That in, oh, okay. In, in the post conventional application of Dharma art, that we are leaving behind good and bad, but mm -hmm. wh where is the place of the necessity for the artist to learn first position, second position, Tanzu, or a scale, B scale? Oh, okay, got How it. How does that yeah. fit in? Very good question. Because to me, yeah. that's an important part of achieving flow, yeah. is a level of mastery. Yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. Great question. So Trungpa Rinpoche talked about the creative process as overcoming what he called phenomenological clumsiness or crudeness. Um, and this is part of the path of art as dough, as a path to uh, enlightenment or evolution for the individual. So in that sense, yeah, you have to learn to, you have to learn the scales before you can play jazz. I mean, it's just like, or whatever you're playing, it's like, jazz is a very um, sort of apt metaphor because you, there's this idea of free jazz, right? You just like, whatever comes out, but it's all like amazing. And, beautiful. And same with like dance. It's like once you learn all those steps, then you can just hop out on the stage and whatever you do is totally beautiful. And, and um, the idea of technique is um, really appropriate because more, the better you are at your technique, the more you are mastering the mind-body connection. So like we talked about with the connection to the body, awakening happens in the body. So the better your technique means the more hours you've actually spent working with the body and the mind together, or what we call the mind. Um, thoughts and thought sense and felt sense together. Like, and we just become masters at going between the two and, and um, we have a greater understanding of how the mind affects the physical world. So in that sense, yeah, it's very, very important, I think. So does that answer your question? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, good question. So, oh, there we go. <coughs> oh, you guys didn't see my slides from before. Dang it. 
um, a thing that represents or stands for something else. That's a symbol. A mark or character used as a conventional representation of an object function or process. Um, the third one is a shape or sign used to represent something such as an organization, whatever. So all of these things are defining what we were calling sign. Because they're pointing to something else. Sign. Points to, let's say, the hat. Which is what we're going to call symbol. Now, apparently, this definition of symbol being the thing being pointed at precedes historically the definition of symbol today. It got changed somewhere, which is really interesting. This is, this is Trungpa Rinpoche's discovery um, about symbol is that the symbol is the thing itself. So the symbol of this would be ink and paper. And the symbol of this would be hat, although this could point to something else as well. This could be a sign for something else. So this is both a sign and symbol. This is both a sign and symbol. This is both a sign and symbol, right? So everything has the potential to be both because we have a thought sense and we have a felt sense. Does that make sense? So. The felt sense is the thing itself. It's the actual direct perception, like when they talk about direct, direct perception in Buddhism, like the direct perception of emptiness. It is you're merging together these two opposites, and it becomes one thing, one, uh, one thing. Oneness, right? Sometimes they call it oneness. So, this is really important in um, the process of creation. Because it's the way to get into flow. When we work with thought sense and felt sense, we start to understand the difference between our thoughts and the thing itself, our actual perception, like the five senses. Um, and normally, we d don't really understand that on a subconscious level. We have to kind of learn it even though it seems quite obvious in this exercise to go through it. Um, it is a process of learning that might take some time. So so tell me what is the thought sense of that object right there? Anybody? Smoke? Lighter? What's that? Are unlucky? Really? I had no idea. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> okay, we'll have to get rid of it after class. Because <laughs> I don't want anything unlucky in this room. This teaching has to go perfectly. Um, so, sure. Oh, ask the question again. Yeah, yeah. What is the thought sense of this object? Light. 
later. What do you think of what mental frozen image do you pull out of the files? Fire source. Fire source. Okay. Cigarettes. Cigarettes. Right. Okay. So the thought sense of that is it's it's pointing to something, right? Like this object is pointing to something. That's the thought sense of it. That's the thought you have. So what is the felt sense of that object? Is thought sense what it's pointing to? Or is thought sense like this is lighter? Um, <laughs> good question. It's this is lighter. It is the pointing. The thought so sense. Can I fire the felt sense well, yeah. I see what you mean. The felt sense? <laughs> I see what you mean. Um, so the thought sense is the mental image that comes up when you perceive that. So if you have a mental image of hot, if there, you know, if there is such a thing, or you have a mental image of a cigarette or a flame, so that is the thought sense of this. Does that make sense? So what is the felt sense of the object? No, no, it's, you don't have to be right. I, I start feeling like what it would feel like in my hands. So I just feel smooth, smooth, coolness, and then the roughness of the thing. OK, yeah, so this is smooth. And you said coolness? Cool to the touch. Right. Is it the metal that's cool? No, no I was thinking the plastic. The plastic is cool? cool? OK, cool. all right. It's interesting that you say that. Um, very interesting, um, but we'll get into that interesting part later. Um, and then this rough part here, um, so that, that would be the felt sense of your touch sense, right? Mm -hmm. What about the other felt senses? What's that? Pardon me? White. OK, so it's white, all right? So we have a visual, and we have a feeling sense. What's that? Yeah, OK, so all right. Clicky. It's clicky. Um, you probably can't smell it from here. I'll smell it for you. Eh, whatever. It smells like plastic. OK. Um, and then, of course, taste. Anybody want to taste the lighter? <laughs> All right, OK. We won't get into that. It's OK. We'll skip that part. Um, so then what is the felt sense of that? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> what is the, the felt sense of that? If you're not directly experiencing it, yeah. is it a thought sense? a thought sense about what the felt experience would be. Oh, OK. So well, that's still a thought sense. And I can have a felt sense of it. You can still have a felt sense of it from there. Because you, your eyes, yeah. Yep. So um, let's pass it around then. OK. So that's a, that would be a thought sense. Because when you say, I feel like, when we say, I feel like, that really means, I think like. Right? We're not saying, really, I feel. It's just. <laughs> so that would, yeah. So that's, an inter that's interesting that you bring that up, because actually, uh, we're going to talk about emotions and like feelings and that kind of thing later. Um, which uh, have a lot to do with thought sense and, sorry? Oh, a sense memory. Oh, yeah, OK. Right, uh, so a sense memory would just be a thought sense in this case. We're just going to oversimplify it, thought and felt.
Yeah, it would be a felt sense that came from your thought sense. Right, right. So triggered by your thought sense, mm -hmm. your felt sense. So now that you guys are way ahead of me already, we're just going to go <laughs> into <laughs> we're going to go into emotion. Um, okay. Yeah, except for seeing it, right. So you have an experience of your wanting. Yep. And if you heard it being passed around, right? Oh, anyway. Yep. Cool. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just going to move along while you guys are experiencing the felt sense of <laughs> <laughs> that lucky lighter. Um, I hope you all get good luck from handling that lucky lighter. So what is this uh, image up here? Anybody recognize this um, modern art? Right. Thank you. Refracted light. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. What's the point of this? The artist Rene Magritte. What was the point of his making this image? Do you think? Why was he telling us that this is a pipe? Or actually, this is not a pipe. This is a pipe. A, a peep, we'll call it a peep. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, so, Art is the lie that makes us realize the truth. Pablo Picasso. Art is, the Art is the lie that makes us realize the truth. <laughs> you crazy artist. Ceci n'est pas un peep is this. Uh, oh, actually. I will also want to talk about the, it's interesting, the, um, a second. Just want to bring this up real quick. The definition of this piece. Is the treachery of images. Um, also translated as the treason of images. I really like that. Um, and this quote by uh, Magritte said, the famous pipe, how people reproached me for it, and yet could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. <laughs> so, um, that's really interesting. Whoa. Wow, let's, let's really get into it. <laughs> yeah, it's still not a pipe. <laughs> wow, I didn't know my computer did that. That's really cool. I'm going to do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get it in there. <laughs> All right, so 
It's a lie, right? The sign is a lie. It's a complete lie. <coughs> but it points to the truth, right? It's a lie that's pointing to the truth. Um, because we're normally not in touch with the truth, we need these, we need creative people like you guys to lie to us and to get us to wake up and see the truth. Um, and in order for that to happen, you creative people also have to be awake first. So then you can tell the lie. Once you learn the scales, you can play the music and then you can tell us all lies and then we'll be like, oh, I never thought of that actually. Or I never experienced that before. That's, wow, that's like direct experience of something that I never had before. Um, so that is the whole, that's the whole sort of um, progression that we make as um, spiritual practitioners and also artists who are grappling with a medium, mastering a medium. Um, we're waking people up. So um, this is Arya Nagarjuna. And I just, real quick, um, he's sort of the, I guess, go-to guy for emptiness and, and Buddhist philosophy and the tradition that is Galupa Buddhism. Um, that this center is uh, uh, in the tradition of this center and the teacher that founded the center. And um, so when we talk about Dunchi or the mental image, um, a lot of this philosophy um, came from this man here, lived from about 150 to 250 approximately. Uh, common era. So um, I just wanted to give you a sort of <clears throat> represent, representation of that, um, where that all came from. This is, uh, oh, Alfred Korzybski said the map is not the territory. So It's mistaking the map for the actual terrain. Um, so the problem um, that we have is we're, um, I've, I really like this quote, uh, our contemporary sickness of the mind is that all we're experiencing predominantly of the mountain is the map. And because we're so habituated to the attaching to these dunchis or these mental images that we have, um, the conceptual elaboration that we have of an object, because we, maybe we never really had a direct experience with that object, um, which is the initial thing that caused that elaboration. The initial thing, um, the experiential symbol is hidden behind our, the screen of our conceptual elaboration of it, our mental image or our dunchi. That is, uh, that's the contemporary sickness of, um, of our time. So, um, so Ken Wilbur, uh, the, I don't know if you know his teachings, but um, he's also very, um, talks about the mistake, mistaking the map for the terrain. And, Where did I 
uh, what else did I want to say about him? I'm not sure. Um, you guys know who that is? Um, this image here, um, I don't I think I have an image of Ken Wilber. No. Um, this is Stanley Kubrick. He said, the truth of a thing is not the think of it, but the feel of it. So, He's, I mean, he, just to give you an example of like a, um, an artist that is sort of clued into what we're talking about um, that we're really familiar with. And so I, now I really want to talk about this emotion thing that you guys brought up. Um, so what happens when, when we have an emotion? Like anger, for instance. We generally call it something. Uh-huh. So we put some label on it that defines what it is. Right. So how does it come about? The emotion or the label? The emotion of anger before we call it anger. And you feel some sort of energy in your body. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, some sort of shallowness and just a feeling of exasperation. Right. Okay. So what would be the cause of that shakiness and shortness of breath? That thought and the emotion and the energy. The thought. Yeah. The beginning Pardon me? The beginning is perhaps the thought. Yeah. The beginning is the thought, you're saying. Yeah. Perhaps. Um, I, I'm willing to say it. All right. Let's do it. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's debate then. Okay, is it anger without the thought anger? Pardon me? Energy before, okay, so there's energy before, is it anger? And so we say thought anger. Is it energy before you say thought is it anger? anger? Before the thought in your mind, this energy is anger. Right. Okay, so an action takes place first. Okay, so why don't you guys argue? Because yeah. Could could there be a feeling without an? Uh, is there a feeling without an action? This is a real question. I don't have an answer. Is there a feeling without an action? No. You can think of yeah. Well, anything is an action. Could you feel? Could you feel something without thinking? Response. <laughs> Could you feel something without thinking? You can't feel anything without thinking. First. Can you feel your hand right now? So can you feel it without thinking a thought? You're thinking about feeling your hand before you feel your hand? You just feel it, okay? What happens if you if you hold your hand over a stove that's lit, like a hot stove? Do you think about Do you think about the pain of what you're feeling before, or like if someone, um, let's say someone just like you're randomly walking down the street and someone just like comes up and knocks you out? <laughs> it's been known to happen. <laughs> Some of the neighborhoods I've lived in. <laughs> what ha were you thinking anything before you felt that pain of that fist like going through your head? That's a good question. <laughs> a phantom hand?
Right. And Right, um, right, yeah. It could be either, or we could then decide right. what that feeling Right, right, yeah, because we have free will, right? right? We can just, we can put any label on that feeling that we want. We can extract whatever from the library of our frozen images and say, I, I want it to be that, like that, yeah. Um, Isn't it sort of like a, it seems to me in some of the documents there's a lot more state from unconsciousness that there is this, initial feeling and then like a split second later there it translates into a thought of ow yeah right kind of like when a baby falls down and like mm -hmm. five seconds later they're like <laughs> but like what happened like what were you doing in those five seconds <laughs> like <laughs> what happened <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. The baby got the idea that that was a bad thing, that I just fell, like, oh no, now I have to, like, go along with mom. Yeah, it's interesting. What's that? Unless it really hurts. Their body is sick, but they don't feel bad about it. You mean? Oh, they don't know that they're sick. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think um, this is a really interesting conversation, but <laughs> what, what I really want to point out about all of this is that it, we're going back and forth from the thought sense to the felt sense. Whatever happens first, I don't know what happens first, but um, the thought sense can inform the felt sense, right? We've established that, that thoughts can inform how you experience the felt, you know? You're, so it can come before, but it can also come after. You feel something and then you have a thought about what you felt, right? Is that also true? So, the interesting thing that Trung Trungpa Rinpoche pointed out is that he said, thought, a felt sense naturally precedes Thought sense. Felt sense naturally precedes thought sense. What does that mean, naturally? I wonder what he meant by naturally. Right, right. It's actually something you have to practice. Yeah. You have to have an experience of it first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So normally, do we have an experience of something before we have a a thought sense about it? Developmentally. Developmentally. What does that mean? Well, when you're a baby, you talk about how you condition each other. Mm -hmm. You have the experience of something, and then someone gives you the label. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Then you develop awareness when you're like seven, and you know what a pool is, you know, and you know that it's like cold and hot, and you're 10. You have this different experience when you're like two or three or six. Right. 
So when we learn, as we develop, like we are taught things, right? We're taught what to think about how we feel or what we're, what our sensations are telling us. Pardon me? It actually separates us from what it actually is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I think Ken Wilber said, yeah, this quote, uh, our contemporary sickness is that primarily we're what we're experiencing of the mountain is the, is the map. So um, we learn this sickness. Um, and so now our job is to unlearn the sickness of, of not having the felt sense come first. So by naturally, I think what he meant is the, maybe, maybe the development, maybe when we were born, we were naturally born that way, like you were saying. Um, or maybe he meant by naturally, like how, our, how we best, how we, function in the world most naturally, easy, most easily in the world. And that is having a felt sense about something and then having a thought about that. So when we have an emotion, like a strong emotion like anger, what they say is that the we're constantly saying, okay, I feel like this is wrong, I feel bad, and then you feel bad, right? And you get, and then you go back from this bad feeling, like, or from this sensation, and you compound it with more thoughts about how this person did something to you, and then you feel it again, you're, kind of, you're informing your felt sense with the thought sense, and you keep going back and forth like that until you're like steaming mad. Um, and then you hold your breath, of course, because you know to hold your breath, gets rid of the anger, <laughs> as we talked about last night. Um, um, but th it's an interesting thing that holding your breath actually, uh, what it does is it takes you back into your body and it cuts off this um, going back and forth thing that is like this um, snowballing effect. So it just completely cuts that off and then you're like, if I keep holding my breath, I'm going to die or whatever, you know, like <laughs> there's a whole different thing going on there. So you just, and then you just kind of forget about why you were angry and then you stop having these thoughts um, at, which are informing the felt sense. So this is how they explain how an emotion comes about, which is really interesting, right? Because if we're constantly focused on the felt sense, and then we just let thoughts come from that felt sense. And then we go back to the, to the, you know, we have the thought, then we go back to the felt sense again. And we learn to do this over and over again. We can train our minds to actually just be coming from the felt sense initially. And then things get a lot easier because we're not going to get angry because, you know, we're not. Um, unconsciously or subconsciously informing our felt sense with our thought sense. Does that make sense? So that's why it's so important to be working with the body um, and the five senses. Um, and I think of like a, a full-on Buddha as like just someone who has mastered that process, you know? Simple as that, totally simple, like nothing else, just felt sense, I'm experiencing felt sense, and then a thought comes, and, and then you are aware of the thought, and like, okay, great, and then you go back to the felt sense again, and you f feel some more things. Um, it's kind of like an idea I have about how an enlightened being functions. Um, I don't know because I'm not an enlightened being, but that's my idea of it. <laughs> so, uh, of course, again, we didn't, oh, actually, you know, we can just wait till the second half. So, um, let's end here because 
did we say 3 o'clock? 3.30. Oh, okay, great. We have more time. All right. Um, so this idea of intuition What is intuition? So, and how is it different? Is it different from instinct? Mm, yes. Go ahead. I would say yes. You are taking it for a book and not okay. expressing your own personal discovery. But in Pauline, in that book of Platville, he talks about the difference between instinct and intuition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And it was their intuition. So you're using five seconds and they worked with it in many years. Uh huh. Okay. And it took scientists years of poking and prodding to say it actually was real. Right. Before these people for five seconds said that. And it was that sense of mastery that gave them that understanding of intuition. That's a new Hmm. And that was that was what he had proposed as the difference between the two. Interesting. To me, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, that's really good. Um, so I think what you said is, to simplify what you said, um, intuition is a felt sense that was informed by a thought sense. And um, yeah. Um, and <laughs> instinct is just wait. It's just felt just felt sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Instinct is just felt sense. Okay, all right. Let's think about that. Let's just let that settle and sit and mull it over. Um, and let's consider another idea. That intuition doesn't come from thoughts. That actually comes from the body. Like you have a gut feeling about something. And then because you, you perceive something with your five senses, you have this sensation which brings about a thought. And then instinct, or instinct would be like um, you had a reaction to something like you, what do we, what are instincts that we have, like? Um, to get out of a fire. What's that? To get out of a fire, yeah. It's a reaction, right? It's like an instant reaction. You, there's no thinking involved, right? So it's also um, a, a felt thing, right? You, there's a fire, you perceive the fire, and then you rush out of, of the building. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of thought involved in that, right? So I'm just I'm trying to frame it in a different way. Um, but there's, there, there is definitely a difference. And I think the difference is 
um, like you're saying, there's there's thought involved in the in the felt sense. There is a thought sense in the intuition, but which is informing which? Is the felt sense informing the thought, or is the thought informing the felt sense, or is there like a going back and forth um, between your frozen mental images and the perceptions that are coming in to your body. Um, I don't know, but I, my, my, my intuition <laughs> <laughs> tells me that intuition is, a, is sort of a higher uh, development of instinct. And they're both learned. We, they're both a learned thing. Um, maybe we have an instinct, like, because we're humans, we have certain instincts, and animals have other instincts, right? Um, I don't think animals have intuition. Yeah. That's not a big difference. Yeah, animals might, may not have intuition. Probably not. So I think scientists tell us that they don't. Um, because why? Because they're not self-aware, right? So then there must be sort of self-awareness going on with intuition. There's a what's that? Okay. Okay. Shame. Uh huh. I think there might be a difference between how we perceive a dog, how a dog functions, and how the dog perceives the dog functioning. Right? Is that is that acceptable? So it's entirely possible that we're placing our ideas about how we work. Uh, we're, we're projecting them onto an animal, um, which is incredibly interesting. But um, I think <laughs> it's another rabbit hole um, that we probably shouldn't go down. Um, but my sense, of, my sense of intuition is that there's some play between what I've learned and um, this felt sense thing. And instinctually, like an instinct being just a reaction, though as a human being, I have a certain reaction to something, whereas another being might not have that same reaction. And one other, another human being might not have the same instinct that I have. So there could be variation between instincts, between people, which tells me that there was something that, that I did to affect that in some way. So it was like learned or something. My body learned it, maybe. You know? It's like moths that fly into the fire. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Moths are going into the fire, we're coming out of the fire. I'm trying to think of who. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, lemmings jump off cliffs, like, you know, it's, it's kind of their instinct, I guess. But um, I just wanted to put that out there because I don't think there's a pat answer for it, but it's a really interesting conversation, um, and it's definitely worth um, considering. Um, and so we had some copy paper here yesterday. Do we still have? Do we still have that? Okay, great. So in the meantime, I'm going to pass this around to you guys. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so everyone should get one sheet of blank paper. So, have you guys done the, the writing exquisite corpse thing, project exercise? What? Yeah. It's called the exquisite corpse. Mm -hmm. So, the exquisite corpse was um, an invention of the uh, surrealists and possibly the Dadaists, which predated the surrealists. Um, a little bit before 1920, around then, um, World War One, the end of World War One, um, and so I, th you know, I think it was probably invented by um, the leader of the surrealist movement, André Breton, um, and it, so it comes from France originally, and. So, um, can I have one of those uh, blank sheets? Thank you. Uh, so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna do this exquisite corpse exercise. Um, and the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna fold like an inch at the top like this. I'm gonna fold it down like that. And then we're going to fold it again. Same yeah, same direction. Same side. What's that? Same, same side, yeah. Mmm, <laughs> possibly. Depends on how far you stray from my direction. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for asking, though. Um, <laughs> keep going until you get to the end. And you should have about, at the end, you should have at least one inch at the end piece. So it, at least one inch at the end there, like that. <coughs> so All right, so everyone has their, their folded piece. So we're going to start writing like this, three lines uh, on the top so that this piece is underneath. And then we're going to write, the first people are going to write um, fourth line under the folded part. So 
what we're writing about is what, what happened in the last week in your life. Something that happened, anything, could be anything. We're just going to write a little story about our life in the last week. Yeah, so you have three lines, one, two, three. Then you do a fourth here. And then you're going to pass it like this without, see, without showing this side. No right, no peeking. So then you're going to pass it to the left. So I would pass mine to you. And then you're going to continue the story, two lines underneath that. And then you're going to fold it one more time. And actually, you can tuck, try to tuck that piece under there so it's hidden. And you're going to, so you're going to write two more lines there, and then one more line at the top of that. Can we go over it as we move through it? Because I don't know if you want to go back. Yeah, totally. Yep. So just, if you have any questions, just. Three lines per little flap, right? What's that? Three lines per flap, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to, there's already going to, when you get it, there's already going to be one line there. Then you're going to add two more lines. You're going to continue the story. <laughs> yeah, you can fit as many letters in, in there as you want. You can write like, like at like 0 .2 font if you want. Yeah, um, it's, but <laughs> it can be anything you want. Anything goes. Okay, so we're going to start out with our story, and then we're going to take the line that the that the former person gave to us, and we're just going to continue that story. However, we want to continue it. Fact or fiction could be just whatever you whatever comes out, um, and as you're doing that, you're not going to think about really about what you're writing. Just going to be you're going to kind of um, you're going to you're going to delete your editor, so you're just writing kind of free form. Um, so. Let's start. Everybody uh, just do your initial three lines, and then do a fourth line on the other side. And let me know when you're done. And it should be fairly quick. This is, we're not going to be thinking about it. We're just kind of like, just keep writing. Just, just go for it. Uh, left. Pardon me? Uh, yeah, three. So, yeah. 
So now you now that there's one right there, you write two more, and then you turn it over and you write the third one on the next part. And then you try to fold the other pages underneath. So there ends up being three there ends up being three lines on each. Yeah, you're continuing that story. You're continuing, yeah, the person to your right story. Mm
<laughs> yeah, any any way you want to do it, we can we can make up better rules next time. It's <laughs> awesome.
Okay, let's do... Are you guys almost finished? One more minute for the people still writing. Okay, five seconds. All right, let's finish it up. And who wants to volunteer to read the one that they have right now? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> the same, they're the same thing, right? Same thing, same thing. <laughs> okay, who wants to go next? Anybody? Okay. Uh, I spent the day with this beautiful baby. It was, it was so fun to hang out with the baby. Later that day, I went on a hike. Purple Tiger is a great exchange for medicinal purposes. <laughs> Good stuff. 
good stuff. All right, anyone else want to read? Come back at four. Let's see. Four thirty is kind of soon. Let's come back at four forty. Um, have lunch and just relax and um, and reconvene. All right. Okay. What's that? Oh no no. You can um, yeah do as you like. Keep them. Throw them away. Whatever. It's fine. <laughs> What's up? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you can leave all your stuff here. 